to JP, but he proposed to her again. James, I said, lick the red off your sucker, I'm sure. And she's going to do a real wedding next year, so hallelujah. That's a precious couple. Real fast, Ken, you got a quick testimony? If you have one, it's probably been a while since you've testified. Amen. So if you'd like to testify tonight, anyone? Real fast? Come on. You did. I appreciate that. Anyone else want to testify tonight, Miss Diane? Here, talk in this because it, it, they can hear you on the internet. I just want to thank God for the wings meeting we had tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, we had precious, precious fellowship. And I'm going to encourage you to tell someone about it and invite them. And what's it, wings about? Wings is widows and widowers in God's service. Amen. It's just a connect group that Pastor had a heart for, uh, for widows and widowers. Amen. Amen. Get the Holy Ghost there, Sammy? Yeah, buddy. All right. Anyone else got a quick testimony? Uh, I got one. In January, we started fasting, you know, and uh, I was 245 pounds. And so, uh, size 38 pants. And so, this is kind of funny. Today, me and uh, I have a guy who is a, goes to our church. He's a personal trainer, and he's, he's been working with me. Well, we ain't been working together for, what, three months now, four months because of the COVID. But I've been keeping up, and, and I have a simple formula. I ain't on no diet. I only put enough fuel in the tank to run the engine. I don't, I don't overfill it. You know, I just don't. I, I, I can eat what I want. I just don't eat a lot. And so that's, that's helped me lose weight. So today, me and him went out to eat because we needed some time together. And uh, I was talking with him. So we went to the boot bar. And I bought, I went in to buy me a new pair of jeans, which I have on right now. It was funny is because of the COVID, he's gone up in size. So he is now the same size as I am, 34, 34. And, and so I was so excited about it. I bought his jeans for him because I said, when you, when you lose weight, I'll take them jeans from you, you know. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm already down where, where you are. So it was kind of a cool move, you know. It's a good thing. and It, make, it just kind of makes you feel good. Uh, how long will you stay with it, Pastor? I, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've been here. But it does feel good. You can imagine uh, 45 pounds off your body, you know, especially with legs like I've got and, and the surgeries I've had. So I thank God for the uh, energy and the things of that nature. My grandkids will be here next week. Looking forward to that. I mentioned Sunday. I said, well, I got to take, find, find a place to fish, take them fishing. And then when, before I got in my truck, people were already sending me messages, watching online, saying, hey, you can come fish at our house. <clears throat> I thought, boy, that's good. I need a bicycle. I need a... <clears throat> No, we're good. Matthew chapter 10. Got your Bibles, Matthew chapter 10. Miss Sheila, good to see you tonight. Amen. Matthew. Tell you, dear family, I love them. Miss them. Amen. Matthew chapter 10. We will get through this. Amen. Sunday morning, I preach to you about peace. That there'd be no peace here, but that really peace is Jesus manifested. Peace is contentment manifested whenever you're just content with things and understanding that in this life, there is no peace. Let me just rock to, for you just a little bit before we get into the message. Uh, in the 60s, I, I'm a, I was born in 1961, so I'll give you an idea how old I am. Be that as it may, in the 60s, uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Malcolm X was assassinated. Uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. We had racial riots. We had uh, the Vietnam War. We had great turmoil in our nation, Sam, if you remember. It was just, it was like everybody fighting and against one another. So what's going on right now is nothing new. Amen. It's happened before. But this is what I want to remind you. I got born again because of people that came through what is known as the Jesus movement that happened in the 70s. So watch what God is fixing to do. Amen. You think for a minute that God's looking down and going, man, I didn't see it coming. He saw all this coming. And out of all this revolt and all this confusion and all this mess. And when I say Jesus movement, you just got to look it up, guys. It was a serious movement. There was long-haired hippies getting saved in Southern California and coming up off the beaches and, and, and doing something services at the beach and getting kicked out of church because the church couldn't handle them because they had long hair and, and flip-flops on you know and it just brought forth a tremendous move and I know some of it was a little bit crazy but some of it was absolutely God-given it was genuine organic uh just just wonderful stuff that took place and through that movement I'm talking about Larry Norman Keith Green Leonard Ravenhill David Wilkerson out of all these preachers that came through there and singers that came through that they affected literally millions on the, on this planet and particularly in America 
which kept moving all the way up into the late 70s, which I got born again through. And it was like a cup of fresh water connecting with people that had this kind of mindset. And I've had this mindset for 40 years. It's still been that holy wild thinking. It's been that, that opportunity of saying, okay, God, and can you imagine if God could take all those protesters that we saw in the streets and give them a purpose and give them a destiny? Because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for attention, purpose, and a destiny. And if they could find that with Jesus, this generation is not lost. Yeah, Amen. On. We got some good things ahead. So I'm kind of holding on. Some people say, why are you still here? Because I want to see what's next. I just want to see what God's got up of his sleeve. Because I'm telling you, something good is still going to happen. You can't just cast America away, away with all this stuff. COVID's from hell. Racism's from hell. Brutality's from hell. Man, don't forget where all this, stu this stuff came from. Right. Amen? Now, Jesus said to us that uh, there would be no peace here. But he also said that blessed are the peacemakers. That it's still important for us to try to keep peace. For us to work on it. I'm always working with churches trying to help them keep peace. I, I know we're a little bit different as a church. And, and uh, some churches get real radical. Some get real conservative. I, I love all the churches. I'm for those that have to shut down or feel like they have to shut down. It's hard as a pastor right now. You're damned if you do and damned if you don't. You, you don't know how this thing's going to work out. So you just have to lead. And you've got to tell people, you do you and I'll do me. Amen. And then we just press through this thing together. And believe God for the best. These are principles I, have never, I haven't forgotten. I've been preaching them for years. Believe God for the best. Accept the verdict. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Are you comfortable? Roy, that's the idea to stand up right there. You're never going to get comfortable. Roy and Paula, we're glad to have them in church. Y'all give them a hand. Yeah, amen. They've been coming out for a few weeks and just got to uh, connect with them just a little bit. So everyone who acknowledges me, verse 32, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also uh, acknowledge them before my Father who is in heaven. Verse 33. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny them before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I've come to bring peace. Now he's talking to his disciples. I didn't come to bring peace to the earth. I have come. Now when he showed up, he was peace. Everybody good with that? The, the peace came. That was him. Everywhere he went, he brought peace into people's lives. But he said, as far as the earth is concerned, concern, I didn't come here to bring peace to the earth. I've come to bring peace, not peace, but a sword. I've come to set a man against his father. Man. A daughter against her mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Mm. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, outside work at the ranch and mowing grass and you know, tractor work, if I can find it, and anything else I can do. And uh, even riding Harleys over here with Joseph, uh, my mind works through stuff like this. And I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to preach it. Because the truth of the matter, when it comes to the American church, we very seldom will trade. We'll trade almost anything for a relationship with God. Uh, we'll give up. You know, we'll, we'll love uh, our family more. We'll love our jobs more. We'll love our occupation more. We'll love our, our hobbies more. And then we give God the leftovers. And I, I, I walk through this and I realize how strong Jesus was. So if I went into the message Bible, it says it like this. Stand up for me. Stand up for me against the world opinion. And I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. That's good. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? Don't you think I've come to make life, don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut. Make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter, mother, bride, and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you from God, for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me, through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. I called this message tonight, Jesus the Great Divider. It's what he does. You know, we think, wow, come together right now. We got this idea, loving one another, a little mushy love. Jesus, Jesus gets 
the disciples together, and he looks at them and says, boys, let me be honest with you. Unless you love me more than everything else in this world, you don't. You don't deserve me. Now, let me just say this to you. I believe you can be a believer and get to heaven. But if you want to be discipled to be a Christian, Come on. Come this on. is Christian talk here now. This ain't where most of us are or have been much lately. We're more like the believers that are being discipled to be more like Christ. Not everybody born again a Christian. Everybody understand that? And it's okay. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Christian only used one time in the book of Acts. Amen. We're believers in Christ being discipled to be like him. And when I read this, I read Jesus as saying, look, this here's got a whole nother level. Amen. And every level's another devil. Amen. Amen. How many know that you don't go through stuff, you grow through stuff? Yeah. You say it again. You don't go, sure, that's one of them knots you got to write down. You don't go through stuff, you grow through stuff. You tell me all the time, you need to go through it. No, I have got to, I got to grow through this. Amen. So when I read this, I got to grow through this. I got to think about what he's saying and, and, and really walk it through. So, Father, thank you for your word. Much prayer here tonight for this little church. And we ask you to bless those watching online. Take this word and impart it to us. Don't let us ever be the same. In Jesus' name. And everyone sit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I felt this way right after I got born again. Uh, you know, as a young man, when I, when I got saved, it was like my parents uh, uh, looked at me like, has he lost his mind? You know, and, and, and you're going to church, and you're serving Jesus, and I wasn't just a church goer. I was a radical. Amen. I, I had my New Testament in my back pocket. I went to ours. I, first, I flipped burgers for the Sonic. I drove that Catholic man crazy that owned the Sonic. Ray, Ray, Ray Law was his name. And I, I had a radio in the back, and I'd listen to the gospel station while I was making onion rings and flipping burgers. And, that, and, and all of a sudden, this guy would come on the radio called R.W. Shambach. And he'd say, shout, yeah, somebody. Amen. He'd hear that on the radio and yell at me, turn that down. I ain't even touched it. I didn't even turn it up. But when R.W. come on, boy, he just rocked the world. Shout, yeah, somebody. Amen. He was, he was one of them radical, send to God people, Sister Dolly. By the way, happy 4th of July birthday to you. Uh, when I saw all the fireworks, I thought about, look at that. Miss Dolly's birthday, all about them fireworks. I never forgot her daddy told her that. He lied to you. But that's okay. You ought to make you feel good. <laughs> But I, so I, I had this radical tendency, and I, I just couldn't help myself. I was just falling in love with him. There's an old Andre Crouch song. I keep falling in love with him over and over, over and over again. I don't know if that's Andre or Dallas Home. Maybe Dallas Home. I, I, I am caught in the 70s time warp right now, I can tell you. But through that, through that uh, teaching and then getting a job at R.C. Cola, I, I told you, when I went to work for R.C. Cola, they, they were 60-something people applied for, for just two or three jobs to be a helper on a truck. I was one of them. And that area is very uh, depressed financially and economically. And we prayed. Me and my friends got together, Bubba and Randy, and we prayed, and God gave me that job. Amen. Amen. I applied on, on one day and got the call the next day. And man, I'm on a truck route with guys who are cussing and filthy. And, and I'm just having the best time of my life. I love, be, let me just be, I love sinners. Oh, I love sinners. I love them. I mean, I love bikers and cowboys and gearheads and, and, that are saved and born again. But I love the sinner ones. Because they, 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 even church folk, yeah, yeah some of them. Uh, but, but there's something about being around somebody who just don't know anything about God. And then you just knew, you got a little bit in you, and, and all of a sudden you start sharing it. And it's an amazing thing that when you know Jesus, it starts attracting people to you. And there was an attraction, and I had, I had folk get, I remember a young man named Brian that got saved in, uh, at RC Cola, became my friend. We both were helpers and workers inside the plant. And then Keith Green, the tremendous singer, musician, was killed in a plane crash. Brian came and told me, I remember crying there at the, at the punch out line at RC Cola and looked over and he's crying. I'm thinking, what, where does this come from? Because we were brothers together in Christ. Well, there was this connection. But on the flip side, there was this dividing between me and my mom, dad, brother, and sister. They didn't see it. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, there's one thing being church folk and another thing just loving Jesus. And I'm not talking to be, about being so radical to the point you push them away. Because the truth the matter is eventually in life you come back and you start balancing out and you know the story my family have all given their lives to Christ but it was a hard thing in the beginning my friends uh, left me they didn't want anything to do with me and you know after they realized I wasn't coming back to them I wasn't I, I'd quit drinking I'd quit smoking I'd quit cussing the best I could uh, you know all the things that I, I burned on my playboys and, and some of my daddies and and, uh, you know, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I tried to do everything I could to clean up. And then I moved into town, left uh, Wheeler Mountain, moved into town. And I just, uh, you know, I, I, I felt the divide. And so when I read this scripture, so when you're walking in this and then you read the scripture, it's like, there I am in the Bible. 
I see it now. I see what you're saying, Jesus. That you do. And, and look here. I'm, I'm 59 years old. Been born again for 40 years. Been preaching for, for about 38 of those years. And here I stand and tell you that my family, who I love, I'm divided with some of them now because of Jesus. Because I won't back away from my stand. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, blood. My kids, uh, family, people that, and, and, and every now and then. But if I back away, or if, let me just say, if I say, well, I, I, let me just go join them. Then I've lost it. So I've got to stay with it because you know that after I got saved, Rex got saved, David got saved, Bill got saved, Michael got saved. All my old friends started coming to Christ. But they didn't in the beginning. But after a while, they stayed with it. So I'm telling you, don't give up on your family. Amen. But I, I know what Jesus was talking about here. And he says here, he carries a sword. And why does he do it? To divide humanity. The, one of the greatest divis, divisive verses is simply this. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Do you understand how divisive that verse is? That you can't get to heaven unless you know Jesus. And you say that to a Buddhist or a Muslim or an atheist. And they're looking at you like, what are you talking about? You know, I, I, I believe that's a hereafter. I believe in God. But they don't confess Jesus. They don't see him as way, truth, and life. They don't see him as the son of the father. Amen. All of a sudden, that thing's divisive. So Jesus is the great divider. That doesn't bother me. I just recognize it and accept it. Everybody good? I'm not trying to justify Jesus and say, you know, you could have been a lot nicer, Jesus. You know, you could have helped us out. No, he didn't do that. He came and he bore the cross. He died for our sins. So I have to give him, hey, kudos. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So that's very important. So there are some things here inside this passage I want to get to. First is confession. I call it reflection. Say it here, hear it there. Say it here, hear it there. The confession is simple. Therefore, if anyone acknowledge me before men, I'll also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. You, you, you know, you acknowledge him by your lifestyle, the way you live, the way you speak, the way you worship, the way you give, the way you uh, honor other people, the way you love folk. Amen. You acknowledge him. And, it, and he says here that, listen, it will reflect. If you say it here, he's going to hear it there. That Jesus said, I will tell my daddy. You talk about it down here, I'm going to talk about it up there. It's very important. Jesus means we either confess him before men or we deny him. We deny him. It's, it's either or. So I think it, well, the truth of the matter is, we need to take that so literal and every day make sure we confess Christ. Right. Amen. To remind us, you know what? The first thing in the morning, if I can remember, Jesus, you are Lord. Amen. If I get opportunity today, I'm going to tell somebody, show somebody that. I, uh, you go back in history. I don't like what I'm seeing in history right now. What I mean by that is, I don't like the statues being removed. I don't like the books being burned. I don't like the erasing of history. Yes, there were bad people then. Yes, there were people that were abusive then. But here's the thing. If we don't learn from history, we repeat history. And if we erase history, then we've not learned anything from it. Right. So it's important to have history. History, uh, you know, the more you know about history, I, if you want to see a stain, you know, they're talking about America being stained with, with the Civil War. Look through this book. And see the stain in this book that God never took out. He showed the failures of men and women. He showed the most, the most debauchery. He showed a rape of a young girl that was sliced into 12 pieces and sent to every tribe to let everybody know that she'd been raped so that they could gather all the tribes together. This book here, my friend, is brutal. Yeah. And God didn't take it out. He didn't remove it. Amen. He shares the death of Samson. He shares the death of David. He shares the, de uh, the death of others in this book. He, he just lays it out for you. He shows families divided. He doesn't take it away. So if you don't learn from history, you will repeat history. So it's very, very important. So confession, confession is very important. Hitler, what Hitler did, I watched Schindler's List again the other night. And uh, I wept. I wept in the movie. I could not, because the footage was so uh, real. And it was so real at times that people would get in on a train car and they would go to their death. And they were, there were so many millions of them, but they never chose to rush the, the Nazis and, and pay with their own lives and maybe spare other people's lives. Lessons again from history. But there was a tremendous uh, theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote several books. They're deep. He's a, he's a thinker. He's a thinker. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. 
You know, and the reason, when I read this about Dietrich Bonhoeffer is to tell you this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer helped plot the assassination of Adolf Hitler. And he was uh, exposed for the assassination. Here is a, come on, here is a theologian, Bible-thumping preacher who was planning the assassination of Adolf Hitler. That's my kind of cat right there, you know what I'm saying? And he was executed for it. One month before he was overthrown. And I think he was in his late 30s. I think 38, 39 years old when he died. So when I read this, I'm saying, here's a man that confessed Christ. Here's a man who, who lived up to it. Here's a man that, that stepped out a little bit. Amen. That confession, your confession always leads to a division. When you confess Christ, prepare yourself because division is coming. Amen. You know, believe this or not, everybody don't believe like you. Have y'all found that out? They don't believe like you. As a matter of fact, it's hard to get two women to agree on how to make one cake. They don't agree on it. You know, it's hard to get anybody to just agree on stuff. So he says, don't assume that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. It, Jesus being this great divider of humanity. And have you noticed how biblical truth divides on social media? I watch people put stuff on social media and it begins to divide. Amen. And, and their stuff sounds just solid to me, but it starts to divide. People will come in after you because they think you either, you know, it's Republican and Democrat right now because we're heading toward November the 3rd. Which, by the way, there are those that believe that well, the cure for this COVID will be found by November the 3rd. So uh, that's kind of a joke, but it's probably true too. Amen. It'll be over then. But, but listen, do you want a non controversial Jesus? Uh, a pink Jesus? A plastic Jesus? A pansy Jesus? I don't want none of those. Because that ain't none of who he is. Amen. He, he's nothing like that. The, the gentle Jesus who smiles and makes everyone feel happy bears no resemblance to the Son of God who came to bring a sword and a judgment. Who flipped tables over in the temple. Does he bring peace? Yes. And the peace he brings will one day cover this entire earth. But that day is not this day. Today we fight. Today we put on the armor of God against the enemy. Today we pick up our sword and enter the fray. Today we stand up for Jesus knowing not everyone will cheer us on when we do. Not everybody's going to love it. But this is what we do. The, the day, my friend, of sunshine soldiers and lazy boy Christians is over. I, I, I've said this years ago. Well-behaved Christians rarely change the world. Well-behaved Christians rarely change the world. Sometimes there has to be a, a, a desire for us to acknowledge Christ. And that's what he's saying here. The truth about Jesus cuts, cuts both ways. You know, one brother believes, one, one brother rejects. For years, my brother rejected it. He rejected it. And then a few years ago, he accepted it. And now we, we talk quite a bit. We talk more on the phone now than we ever had in my life. Amen. That boy will call me up. He just won't talk. Hey, brother, so you don't. You'd have to hear my brother talk. Because he's about as hillbilly and redneck mixed. And I just love that boy. But he'll, he'll watch me on Facebook say something. And he'll call me up. Hey, brother, that was pretty good right there. You know, he likes that radical bend that his brother still got. You know, he, he likes that edge. And, uh, you know, I'll preach something and he'll go get it tattooed on him. I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's my brother, man. He, 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 don't, he, he may not say it, but he'll throw it up at you, you know. It's very important. A father, uh, you know, a father follows Jesus and mothers go her own way. One chooses, one, one rejects. I see it. I've seen it all through. When, when people come to church, you know, sometimes I see the wife come, and that husband, he, he hates her for coming to church. You know, and that's why I love to see when couples come. But I, I'll often tell that sister, you keep standing for God, you keep believing God, amen, until. Is that happened to you, Valerie? You kept standing, believing God, till Sam gave up. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, happy day. And that, that, that's what we do. We just keep on standing. Because this is right and this is for eternity. Amen. And the, then that division is going to lead to a decision. The person who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. The person who loves son or daughter more than me. What he's saying here is, and you, you've got to understand the comparison, and this is what, how I see it, is that you can't allow anything to eclipse your love for God in comparison. It has to do with comparison. You know, I love my wife. I love my kids. But I, I've got to maintain my love for my Savior. Amen. I, I just got to keep on loving Him. The truth of the matter is, one day, all of us are going to start disappearing from this planet. And the one thing that won't disappear is our love for Him. Jesus says some very hard things to His followers here. That you got to love. You love me more than your parents. That, those were tough for me to understand. James chapter 4 tells me that my life is not going to last very long here. And you realize that already. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while. 
then vanishes. Even one translation says we're like the vapor on a window pane in the winter time. Psalm 90 verse 5, in the morning it flourishes, it is renewed. In the evening, it fades and withers, speaking of our life. You know, it's appointed unto man once to die, the Scripture says. Father, time is undefeated. Yeah. Amen. One out of every one die. That's undefeated. Amen. It's, it's, it's crazy. Do you know, I, I, I wrote this before COVID, this, this one stat, because I don't know where we're at today. So this was before COVID. 150,000 people die every day in, in the world. 150,000. Can you grasp that? 150,000 people around the globe die every day. That's 53 million people die every year. That means folk are leaving this planet and coming into the... You know the birth rate is greater than the death rate? So we got more babies showing up than we got folk getting out. And the cycle never stops. Amen. Season after season. I was born... I blinked, and it was over. We've all seen gravestones with the name, a date of birth, a date of death, with that dash. You've heard me talk about the dash. I preached one on the car show once about it. You know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, hard work, laughter, tears, traveling, moving, getting married, raising a family, building your career, starting a new job, building your nest egg, planning for retirement. And then one day, death knocks on the door. What do you have to show for all those years? And this is what you get on your gravestone. A dash to cover your whole life. Come on. Amen. To deal with everything that you've gone through. Amen. So the question becomes, what, what are you doing with the dash? What are you doing with your life? How, how are you planning this thing to, to end? Are you still pressing toward purpose? Do you believe in your destiny and all the things that God has for you? There, there are two men that I was very familiar with when I was in Bible college. One of the guys named Jim Elliott. And the other one was named Bert Elliott. And Jim Elliott was a missionary. Amen. It went to Ecuador. January 1956, him and four other missionaries were killed by the Uka Indians. There was a book called Through the Gates of Splendor. He was murdered on the beach. The story made headlines around the world. There were movies built about it. Uh, books, movies. More than a half century later, we still talk about Jim Elliott's famous words. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain which he cannot lose. I want that to soak in a minute. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. You know what you cannot keep? You can't keep this. You can't keep this. Amen. Jesus said you got to lay, this here got to be laid down. We call it dying to the flesh. Amen. And, and serving God and living for God. So here, here's Jim. He makes this powerful statement. There's this word. A few months later, Bert, his brother and wife, Colleen, returned to the same jungle in Peru where they were uh, murdered on the beach by the Indians. Randy Alcorn described Bert Elliott as a faint star that rose night after night, faithfully crossing the path in the sky to God's glory. Jim Elliott was a great meteor streaking through the sky. Bert Elliott was a faint star crossing the same path night after night. Which one did the greater work? Why did one die young and one live to 87? Bert was 87 years old when he passed away. No one can answer those questions. Because the answers are hidden in the mind of God. It is enough to know the call of Christ is the same for all of us. Jesus calls us from the cross. He calls us to the cross. Years ago, we used to sing that song. I remember singing, the world behind me. I know you sung it a hundred times, Dick. The world behind me, the cross before me. No looking back, no looking back. You know, there was something about moving forward like that. And so when you read about one man, I don't understand why I got some people are taking young. Uh, I re it really hit me the other day. A lot of the friends I've had through life, they're gone now. Amen. I've, outli I've outlived more friends than I can imagine. I had no idea I'd get this old. And I look back on it, you know, and I, I remember, uh, I'm trying to think of his first name, Randy Hawkins. Is it Randy? Is that his name? Donna Hawkins' husband? Yeah. Jeff, Jeff Hawkins. Randy's my friend in Baton Rouge. Jeff Hawkins was 50, 52, 53 when he passed. Amen. I look back and I just see, you know, people that were in, this, in the pews here in this church. And it just, the longer I'm alive, you know, you're still going to see it. Remember Jack? Amen. With his suave hair. Black Johnny Cash look to him. Amen. You look, you realize in this life, you don't know why God lets somebody stay around a long time. Sometimes he takes them young. I'll never know. 
But if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it in the end. If you lose your life for Jesus' sake, in the end you'll save it. It's worth that to save it. Come on, come on up here, my friend. So let me tell you, when I read this, when I say when Jesus said, you take up your cross and you follow me. And I think about what's going on in our world today. No Supreme Court decision can put Jesus back in the grave. No terrorist attack can reverse the resurrection. Come on. They can burn our churches, but they cannot destroy our gospel. Come on. Remember, the church was born on the wrong side of the tracks. The church was born on the wrong side of history. Mm-hmm. That's where we were. We've been on the wrong side of history since Rome. And it was enough to turn the world upside down. We're not the first generation of believers to find ourselves unpopular. God's not surprised by the Supreme Court. He's not floored by Planned Parenthood. He's not intimidated by the virus. We preach Christ risen and coming back soon. We preach a Christ who will save anyone. We preach a Christ who will rule over the nations. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Take it up. Take it up. See, the thing is, you don't know all the time what my cross is, and I don't know what your cross is. And I can't make my cross your cross, and you can't make your cross my cross. Amen. Many times we look at people and say, well, I don't see you pressing. Look, I don't know what you're bearing. I, don't, I have never walked in your shoes. I don't know what you deal with at home or at work or at school. You know, I don't know what you're, what's going on. But I can promise you this. You keep carrying your cross. You say, God, I, I'm, I'm going to keep the cross in front of me, the world behind me. You didn't, come, you didn't come to make me popular. I'm bothered. I'm a little bit bothered that preachers become popular. I mean, I'm, I'm a little popular, which bothers me sometimes. Because then I go, God, am I, am I doing everything all right? Because the truth of the matter is, I really don't like real popularity. What I do like is real effectiveness. So if I'm being effective and that blesses people, I'm good with all that. But I just don't want to be a showman. I, I don't want to just be popular. I want to make sure people know I've carried my cross. Amen. You know, I gather sometimes with older preachers and we get talking about the past. Somebody mentioned Billy Hickenbotham back there a while ago <laughs> on a motorcycle. Mike, you remember Mike on a motorcycle? Yeah, yeah wrecked. Didn't wreck, just run into somebody. Uh, pop the clutch. It's just funny. But I, here's the thing. Here's the thing I think about. How, how far me and you go back? You know? So I, I worked through this, Miss Jeanette. I, I worked this thing out in my life, and I realized it took a lot for us to get to where we're at today. And I may only have 50 folk in here and maybe 100 people watching. But the truth of the matter is, I thank God for this place. I thank God for what we've been through. And, and I don't think God's done with us yet. Amen. And I ain't worried about everything being peaceful. And, but I am worried about people. I'm not worried. I ain't worried about nothing. Amen. I am concerned about people realizing that, look, I can't hold on to the things in this world. I've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. When you get ready to go to the grave, everything. And that's a scary thought, isn't it? Because some of y'all got lots of stuff. Amen. You got to start figuring out how to parcel some of that out. Start letting some of it go and say, God, help me to put, sow that seed in the right place. Because that seed's important. Father, I thank you for your people tonight. I ask your blessing upon them. I pray this word. Lord, you are a divider. Yes, you are. You divided me from friends and family. And yet, you connected me with more friends and more family. You never took away from me from that which you would not add more to it. That's what kind of father you are. You're a good, good father. So I thank you for the word of God tonight. I thank you for the impact it's had on us. And I pray for a change in our lives. And God, we're not going through it. We're growing through life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God a praise in here if you would. Amen. With others, amen. You'll join us on Sunday morning here at uh, 8.30, somewhere between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. I really don't know when they kick that camera on. You just be ready. Love you. God bless you. See you next week. Guys, don't forget to...